Kevin, thanks for joining us. We're just delighted to have you on the podcast. We're really here to talk about the Halligan Bar in this year's competition to see if we can't give some of our student team some insight in the things they might do to improve their performance or at least understand what the challenge is. And so we've got well over 40 teams um, waiting to compete. We've got Andrew Christich, who we talked to a couple of times, and he makes the training equipment. So he's going to bring some of that up. So some of the tests will be having the student teams open a door and do other things. And so that can be fun using the using the spike to bust something and maybe even the hammer part of the claw to do something. So we're planning to do all that. My understanding is you're a talented blacksmith, but I don't know that that's true because Pat told me that was true. And it's, I'm never quite sure when Pat tells me something exactly where to locate that in space. <laughs> but I understand you're a talented knife smith who really has some metallurgical background as well. And I'm a sort of a, a amateur metallurgist, haven't worked in the steel industry for about 30 years. So that could be fun. And then I also understood I fought, and you can you can tell me you, you have some background in firefighting. You know what we're talking about is something I understood. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. And I would describe myself as the same. I definitely an amateur wannabe metallurgist. Um, not good enough to be a blacksmith with a hammer, but more than sufficient enough to in uh, with a hammer to be a bladesmith. Okay. Um, and yes, I have over 30 years of experience in the fire service, and I'm actually the uh, deputy assistant chief of the local volunteer fire department as well. Oh, okay. Wow. Wow. So how big is the town if it's a volunteer fire department? Um, not, not really large. Uh, we we cover a town and a large area around it in the township. Oh. Geez, I don't know, maybe around the population of 5,000 or so. How many times in the actual fire service have you ever used a Halligan bar? Uh, many. Not quite in the same ways that uh, large urban departments would use it. Uh, okay. we, we don't do as much going through larger steel doors uh, in, in more industrial type buildings uh but we do use it for opening up wooden structures i personally have peeled my share of car hoods back with the spike on the end of a halligan bar <laughs> uh it we have to be a little more creative with it sometimes i would say <laughs> wow oh that's great that's great so um so I was surprised when I talked to Andrew because he's making my Halligan bar as a casting with me so that we can compete against Ben Abbott, who actually forged one. And he's been on our podcast talking about how he forged one for the competition. And every blacksmith I've talked to said it's a real pain in the ass to make a Halligan bar. <laughs> which, which I, and, and, and then, of course, Andrew showed that that the easy way to do it is to make the ats on one end of the claw on the other end out of a bar and then weld the spike onto it. But then you can bust the spike off with some regularity because it's not that easy to weld on. And then one of the things that really surprised me was that uh, the preferred alloy is 4140. Mm -hmm which is really, from a metallurgical standpoint, sort of an odd choice because um, it, you really want some toughness and ductility and um, the sort of sweet spot for the carbon content if you want optimal performance of like a 30.30. That keeps you from having challenges with brittleness in the weld and all that kind of stuff. And you get really close to the same properties. But the other thing that surprised me is clearly the bar that's available is normalized and tempered, not quenched and tempered. And it doesn't look like anybody in, anticipates quenching and tempering it. And so they're using 60 KSI as the yield strength for design, which is about half of what we're going to provide because that's a yeah. really trivial thing for us to do is to get much higher up there. Is there some 
reason other than it's just convenient, available, and economic to use 4140? What Do you know the history of why they selected that alloy? I've noticed that it seems to be the standard as I look through the, the different halogen bars that are available to us these days. Um, you know, it appears to be 4140 quite often some sort of, sort of a plating on it. Uh, or some similar treatment. Why they're using that? I would say it's probably it's probably cost effective and availability. Uh, cost effectiveness and availability would probably. That's my best guess on it. Is exactly what you were saying. Yes. Yeah, yeah. I was, because when I was talking to Andrew, we're going to modify some of the features because it's easy for us to give him a, a bar that's much stronger than that. One of the things that we'd have the benefit of as making it a prototype as a casting, is that our cost has nothing to do with the actual cost of production of that one bar. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. so it's really trivial for us to go ahead and make a sort of an optimal uh, halogen bar, but it really wouldn't cost us dramatically different than, um, than the ones that are available on uh, already for sale. Mm -hmm. to make it as an investment casting with real high quality. So I'm really sort of interested in continuing to explore that. Yeah. Um, Andrew said that he had reports, and of course we in the casting world always suffer from the fact that people think castings are brittle like cast iron. And so if you break it, they're going to think that that's because it's a casting, not because you did something stupid with it. <laughs> um, and so... Have you had any experiences with failures on halogen bars? Have you bent one? Have you busted one? Um, no, but before we get to that very quickly, I can appreciate the cost effectiveness part of it because now in my position after all these years of actually having to deal with budgets on the fire department, fire department equipment is very expensive. Yes. And so it, 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 you know, being economically competitive it, it, it would be kind of important uh, because, yeah, it, it, all fire equipment is very, very expensive. But now moving on, um, no, I've, I've never actually done much damage to one. Um, and I've I've treated them fairly roughly. I know that. Uh, <laughs> uh, but they're built so heavy. If, if I had, I mean, if, if I could, you know, if I was if I if I was cleaning my lamp and out popped the proverbial genie, and I could ask uh, you know like some of the impossible maybe things to get out of one thing with a halogen bar, it would be a, a lighter weight um, along with the strength and obviously, obviously you got to keep this within the proportional range of the stress strain curve. You don't want any sort of you know bending or anything like this. Um, but I think also uh, I, they're trying to do, do, you know, avoid, um, you know, too much flexing as well, because that, that could be problematic in a lot of the uses. Thus, they compensate with very thick cross sections on halogen bars. This makes them very, I mean, I know they're lighter than they used to be, but they're still very heavy to use. Yeah. Now, are they, um, I mean, we put a limit on them. It seems like 12, 13 pounds is a pretty typical kind of weight, which is a heavy, heavy bar. Yeah. Um, and so that makes sense. Um, I mean, part of the use is you really do need some of the momentum on some of the things you do. And then yeah. of course, you're going to use it like a, like a um, fuller uh, that a blacksmith uses where you're going to pound the back of it. And you don't want it to spall off or anything, I assume. Yeah, yeah. As far as far as uh, yeah, for things like for things like yeah, hammering on it uh, and um, other other really you know really bullying things about uh, yeah, I could see the 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 weight. Um, once again, the you know I've I've used that that spike a lot for penetration, and actually sometimes objects can get heavy enough that you can't get the speed behind them to actually penetrate with things. Sure. 
Sure. And so, uh, you know, for, for like punching through steel or I've even opened up roofs with that spike when we, you know, couldn't get an ax up yeah. there in time. Um, being able to actually swing this, the, the thing quickly would, would be a benefit. You know, not, not that I'm saying we need to redesign this thing entirely. I'm just saying firefighters oh, sure. are already wearing so much gear. Uh, we are already so weighted down that uh, that that that's like my only criticism of the Halligan bar. I love the tool, the wonderful yeah. things you could do with it, but uh, it boy, they're heavy. <laughs> yeah, yeah. One of the things that surprised me, like like when I was young, you never thought screwdrivers would be any different than they were, and now you put buildings together with screwdrivers. Oh yeah. Andrew was pointing out that on the on the claw side of it. They now sharpen the inside and make it so it'll fit right over a Yale lock, so you can squeeze it in there and pop the lock out. Yeah. You go, yeah, you know, it only took forty years to figure out that would be a good <laughs> idea, <laughs> which is pretty amazing. Now, um, Ben upset the end so he could split it and make the spike and the ads. So you three are forging people. Do you have alternative ideas, Patrick, Declan, and Kevin, on if if I said make me a Halligan bar, would you start out? Would you start out with a much thicker bar, and just go ahead and and um, uh, forge it out so that you could make the end the way you wanted to, or would you do what Ben did? So I would not do what Ben did, having watched some of those clips that's just way more work than i want to do um so i have forged a couple of them here recently uh as practice pieces and demonstration pieces and my approach was to forge a thick rectangular section uh roughly an inch and a half thick by three and a quarter inches wide and then use side set tools to section off the material i needed for the various features of the of the tool and then and then forge those to shape. Uh, so the uh, the spike ends up being drawn out perpendicular to the main uh, shaft. And then the adz blade ends up being um, uh, fullered and bent at, uh, in the opposite direction so that you end up with the, the three different features all coming out of the same corner. And then uh, the the shaft is drawn out, and uh, it, you basically leave kind of a a palm sort of shape on the on the other end that can be forged down and drawn out and spread to create yeah. the. You've got to put normally you put the claw on the other end, so you right. So that that's right. Yeah, yeah. Claw, yeah. Right. So the claws on one end, and then the ads and spike are on the other end together. So the way I did it was I I drew out. The shaft mostly and forged the claw end first uh and that allowed me to handle the workpiece without having to use a, a pair of tongs and have sure. you know sure. metal that i'm trying to work that's three and a half feet away from my body um <laughs> and that that worked pretty good but it's really um at least the way that i did it it, it was really quite an exercise in planning your work because um you, you have to account for the volume of each feature and how you're going to get that volume from one starting cross section and, and redistribute that volume through a forging process to get what you yeah. need in the end. And you also have to make allowances for things and like trying to get into tight corners with your, with your forging hammer. That's hard to do. So you maybe have to leave that section a little thicker than you think you do when you just plant it on paper. You have to leave a little bit more metal there. If you have more time, more time back and forth in the fire, you may have to leave a little bit more allowance for losses to scale. So if you try to cut your starting piece to weight, which is what I did the first time, you know, based on my plan on paper, I came up, you know, I came up deficient in certain areas. So I had to allow, had to allow some extra, but I got it to work. You know, I got it to work. Um, but so if you make it that way, uh, which is a, sort of the same way we would approach open die forging on sure. something here at work, um, it's a it's a wonderful challenge, but it is a challenge. Yeah, yeah, I, I expect yeah. it. Actually, I'm happy that it's not a very good thing to make as a casting either. But I always think those are great competitive items because it forces the student teams to have to think through how do I handle the ordinary challenges I'm going to face? Because challenges you face when you're making something that doesn't fit the process, 
um, are the ordinary challenges we face every day when somebody wants us to make something and the process is the right process, but there are features in it that are somewhat challenging to make as well. Sure. Well, I, when I did it, I took the approach of trying to use the least amount of metal possible to make all the features. And I listened to your podcast with Andrew and I took his design ideas and incorporate that into what I was working on. So that's where I got my target dimensions. Um, if I had not uh, restricted myself to trying to be material conservative, yeah. then I could have taken a different approach. For example, I could have drawn out, I could have taken a very large cross section, drawn out uh, a shaft uh, with a claw on one end and actually left that large cross section massive enough to actually just torch cut out material that I didn't want and give me most of what I needed for both the ads and the spike already in their correct orientations with just a little bit of cleanup work. And, yeah. and if you're thinking about the most efficient way to make something versus the most material efficient way to make something, you may choose to do something like that. Because yeah. to, to Kevin's point, that may actually be the more cost effective way to make the product. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What, um, yeah. So when you did that, how much how much finish work did you do? How much? What was the balance between hitting it red hot with a hammer and grinding and polishing? I didn't ever get any to the point where I started to do grinding and polishing, but for the shaft section, which I forged to a one inch octagon, okay, it was clean one inch octagon, and most of the other places were also pretty clean. Where I was going to need to do some finishing work would have been on the spike because it's hard to make a true round conical spike. Yep. Uh, so that was going to need some cleanup work. And then the width of the ads, you know, varied a little bit that needed to be cleaned up a little. And then the claw, I, I forged to the outside dimensions, but I was going to need to go back in and cut the, 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 the split, cut the V yeah. in there. So, so I have a little bit of work to do to, to make that uh, and you, finished. You, you'd have to clean up the corner because Andrew was really pretty specific about that. Um, you, you would a little bit, but I, the way I did it, it came out with a pretty crisp corner in there because I, I, you're with forging. You can't, you can, if you use the right tooling, you can make some fairly sharp corners through forging processes. Were there any, were there any tricky things you did? Like, well, as you know, I'm a real hack in terms of blacksmithing, but a real hack. And so sometimes when the kids are bending their hook over the horn of the anvil and it's not quite shaped right, I can show them that you can put it in the printle hole right? <laughs> and just bend it, straight it out. Why screw around with a hammer? Yeah, so, yeah. so, so the, the, the tricky things maybe were things like doing what are called convenience bends. So when I wanted to have access to that spike, yep. I took the shaft and bent the shaft 90 degrees from its orientation in use so that I could get that spike under the power hammer dies to draw it out. Okay. And I did something similar. Once the spike was formed, I, you know, I, I, I bent the shaft back into its proper orientation. Then I bent the spike out of the way. So I had access to the ads. And by the time it was all done, everything was bent back all where it needed to be, to be a finished part. How how hardcore were you? How much did you use the power hammer instead of... Yes? As much as I possibly could. <laughs> That's why I have power hammers. Like, you know, I I forged these out of... Uh, so I did some practice pieces out of 1018, and I did a couple out of 4340. And forging a piece of inch and a half by three and a quarter 4340 is just... Or, or 1018, for that matter. That is not happening by hand. No, uh, it's... You can do Thanks it. for agreeing with me with your smile, Kevin. I appreciate that. <laughs> well, well, when the question was first posed, how we'd go about it, the first thing that came to my mind is, do I get to use my power hammer? <laughs> well, I, I, that was that was a prerequisite for me. I actually did this demonstration in Maryland uh, on a power hammer. Um, uh, Kevin would probably recognize a uh, Sinhalir uh, power hammer. Uh, they were. Uh, uh, similar to a coon or a, oh god okay a, yeah. oh, oh 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 you're okay yeah. your pronunciation is I know exactly what you're talking oh, okay about. Yeah. yeah maybe I didn't pronounce it right but uh, I probably you know just, the type I'm talking about yeah yeah I know the spelling and I've I've been right. pronouncing it incorrectly but go ahead <laughs> oh, well anyway 
The important thing is that you know the size machine I'm talking about, roughly 150 pound ram weight. And that machine just barely was able to work that inch and a you know, inch yeah. and a half by by three and a quarter. Uh it did it, but it was, you know, it was at the limit of what you would do with that machine. Um so I mean you can find workarounds, right? I mean, you can find tooling that you can use to you know make that still work and all that but oh, but sure, to just sure. straight draw that out it 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 did work that machine yeah 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 your die you can make the die pointy enough small. yeah there's there's things you can do i i used a lot of handheld tooling when i did that project but at home my hammers are bigger so I, they don't they don't struggle to move the material when i'm at home <laughs> yeah I, I was going to say that I had no criticism about the method of up, you know, of upsetting. If you were limited to not having as much use of a power hammer, then I would probably take that route. For me, I've always thought the term upsetting is a really appropriate name for it because that's I've gotten upset just about every time I've tried that operation in one way or another. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah. Uh, I it, agree with you. Yeah, you got to be a pretty good smith to actually really build up a lot of mass with proper upsetting, and the, the temperatures are fairly high. But if I wasn't using a power hammer, yeah, I'd go that way. But if I have a power hammer, I'm going to do it exactly the way you did it, Pat. Okay. You, hey, now come on, you're you're a, you're not only a forging guy, you're a metallurgist, so you've got to have at least two other opinions to share. <laughs> about how you're going to do it <laughs> well i mean if you were going to do it as a closed die forging right if you took the time to make tooling you could also do it there are, there are other ways to do it instead of instead of upsetting or sectioning and drawing the way i described another way to do it would be to start with a relatively wide rectangular section and actually split and bend open mm -hmm. those features that are the spike in the ads and there's a wonderful book written in the 1930s called um blacksmith's manual illustrated which kevin probably has a copy of that just like i do that that shows how to do that kind of work and it's a it's it, it's really eye-opening um if all of your prior experience has been kind of handwork at the anvil or if your primary work is in bladesmithing as opposed to general forge work seeing a book like that one and seeing all the different ways people can treat a piece of metal like a piece of clay to get what they need in the end is really quite interesting. Let me uh, ask a question for all three of you. you. You're you're at least familiar in passing with social media stuff. Who are the good people on social media? The black bear guy, I like him because he's simple and he's he's showing you really ordinary techniques you'd use to do certain things. But I think, Pat, you said there's other folks that you think are at least that good or better. And just we've got a, we've got people in schools that don't know. Um, and so who who would you which which teaching person, what online presence would you recommend for someone? And, and when you tell me, if you'll email me later uh, with the links, we'll put the links on screen when we actually show it so the kids can go right. Yeah. Through. Yeah. I, I know, actually, I think I shared a, a list with uh, Declan and maybe with you, Raymond, but a few people about two weeks ago. Yep. Uh, and I would go back to that list, but I would, I would qualify that with um, it. It So here's the metallurgy answer, right? It depends. <laughs> I, I knew you couldn't wait i knew i knew that was coming at some point. well you know it, it wouldn't be a good metallurgy talk if i didn't get that in there at some point right um but it does because if you're interested in primarily an educational experience yeah. then black bear forge is one of the very best um price centered ironworks is also very good uh daniel moss uh, who doesn't put a lot of stuff up lately, but was doing some things. He's over in England, very, very skilled. Uh, and there's several others. If your interests are more, I would say, inspirational rather yeah. than educational, um, um, Will Stetler and Alex Steele. Uh, and if you really are into, into bladesmithing in particular, Kyle Royer does some phenomenal work. There are, I'm sure, a bunch of others as well. One of the things, and I, I do enjoy, I really have always enjoyed watching people make things. So I find that 
the YouTube and social media are great ways for me to be entertained and and educated. But one of the things that um, I've, I've noticed is there are some people who have as their primary uh, focus education. So Black Bear Forge is like that. Christ Centered Ironworks is like that. There are probably some others. And, and that really comes through in their in their right. videos. You can see that they take the time to walk through the steps that are needed to create whatever the project is they're featuring. But Kevin, you, you're you a self-taught metallurgist. What metallurgy books did you find the most helpful in really trying to get your head around how steel works? Oh, I'm going to probably show how old school I am here. Anything by Edgar Bain. Marcus Grossman, any of those. Uh, wow. Yeah, I love yeah. the classics. Huh? <laughs> and, and honestly, I would second that. So I, I you know, my, my metallurgy education probably started slightly after Kevin's. Um, but Bain and Grossman's books were not used in school when I was a student in the late 90s and early 2000s. And I now have as a requirement that every one of my intern read, every one of my interns is required to read Grossman's Principles of Heat Treatment. Yeah. I have three copies floating around here of various ages, um, you know, because it was printed five or six different times. Um, but that book I was given by another uh, Damascus guy. Kevin, you might remember um, George Worth. Oh, George. Yes. Cease now. Yeah. But uh, George lived uh, not too far from where I'm at. And as he was um, getting older in years, he started to give away his books, which many of them came to me. And in one of the bags of books was this book by Marcus Grossman I'd never seen before. And I read it and I went, why didn't I have that when I was in college? It makes face diagrams so much easier. It's just yeah. such a good book. Yeah. Well, you, you can't deny Bain. Uh, oh, absolutely. He literally wrote the book, but I've always enjoyed reading Grossman more. I, 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 can, I can absorb it better from Grossman. Mm -hmm writings yeah and somebody else to mention that's a little bit later on that actually picked up the torch and ran with it that i'm a great admirer of is george kraus yes sure. i have his books too yeah mm -hmm. and and vandervoort of course <laughs> yes yes i know i know i know george vandervoort yeah, reasonably yeah well. i know i know yeah. george kraus we've had him speak a couple of times we're actually doing yeah. work with colorado school of mines and so we're still working with some of those folks i actually when i started in steel ASM was dumping all those books. So I've got the Zay Jeffries book. I've got yes. all kinds of, of the old books. And there's this platonic dialogue. Why does steel get hard when it's quenched? I'm trying to remember. It's the French guy. And I can't remember his last Ray name. Muir? Who? You're going all the way back to Ray Muir in seven, the 1700s? No, 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 no. This is, oh. this is somebody who was a, a contemporary a little before Bain and Grossman. Floris and, Osmond? Who? Osmond? No, no, no. Um, okay. I'll have to look for it because it was really great because, you know, it's the student asks and the master and it's a platonic dialogue. Oh, no, no. You're talking about Albert Swaver, who was yes. not French. He was an American guy that was out at MIT. And yes, he that's called A Metallurgical Dialogue is the name yes. of that book. I have yes. a copy of that one. Um, he wrote some fantastic books. Yes. Um, if you he's got a book on and and Kevin, I don't know how how old your collection goes, but if you're looking for some really fun older work, uh, books by Albert Swaver and um, Henry Marion Howe um, yes, from yes. 1912. So I've got two copies of of this book called um, it's I think it's Heat Treatment of Cast Iron and Steel by Swaver. I have a 1912 edition, a 1936 edition, and and those books go through and walk you through the idea of the original cooling curves, how people came up with understanding that there was a, such a thing as a phase change. Floris Osmond, the guy I mentioned yes. earlier, was in late 1800s, and he was the first one to do co cooling curves and establish a, a, a what we would call a scientific understanding of the idea that there's a phase transformation. And then, you know, the guys that, that were his contemporaries, which included Albert Swaver and um, Henry Marion Howe and uh, D.K. Chernoff out of Russia. Um, these guys were all taking uh, the microscopes. Osmond was one of the first, not the first, but one of the first to use microscopes super, super effectively in industry. Um, 
and he's the guy that actually named several of the of the structures that we see in steel uh, he was the one that named them um wow. he's the one that gives us the ar and the you know the, that whole a ae1 and ar and that all comes from flores off now so so uh, patrick you can't answer the question unless nobody else knows the answer we've got alpha gamma and delta what happened to beta you know, Declan, do you know, Kevin, what happened to beta? Beta iron. No, 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 I don't. I, Patrick, I, I assume. I have to, I'd have to crack open one of those books behind me. <laughs> yes, yes. No, no. It's actually pretty fascinating. Um, steel will lose its magnetism before it actually completely transforms. And mm -hmm. they thought there was another phase change in there. So oh, beta wow. phase was actually named and, and they looked for it, never found it. So the terminology went away. It's yeah. one of the really odd questions. That allows you, to get, <laughs> you can get those old books that I was just mentioning. It shows up on those early phase diagrams. <laughs> because when you do a cooling curve, it shows up. Yeah. You see it on the cooling curve, or especially if you're looking at changes in magnetism. But when but we've come to understand that if equilibrium phase diagram is to show us changes in crystallographic structure. And so it you don't see a change between ferrite and austenite. It's just ferrite and austenite. That's it. Um, but you do see, like you said, this magnetic response change, and that was part of their early studies. And so, of course, they put beta on there because they could measure a change <laughs> in properties. So yeah, yeah you've got to you you got to use beta, and that actually that actually came up to be not an insignificant issue in the world of metallurgy in the early 1900s. And like there were heated heated arguments and papers that were written about whether that was a real thing or not. And there were people who were very well educated and very knowledgeable that came down on different sides of that argument, and it wasn't really settled until they came out with x-ray diffraction and be and mm. able to use that as a tool to actually establish what's the difference between ferrite and austenite at the at the atomic level one of the one of the early things um, that was a big debate was all the way up through 1910 1915 the people who made steel in solid state without melting were still contending that hitting it red hot with a hammer clearly made it a better metal. And so just pouring it as a liquid can't be that good. And so there was a big debate between solid state processing to make steel and liquid processing to make steel. And of course the liquid guys did win um, that debate that you get more uniform properties and all that kind of stuff. But that was, that was also a big debate. So I actually have the making shaping and treating a steel with Carnegie. Okay. <laughs> hmm. Car the, the Carnegie Steel Company printed it to begin with. Wow. There, there is one person that I, I, I realize I'm going down through the book, you know, people that have influenced me in the books, the, 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 and there's, there's, there is a very large figure that I've left out that mo almost all bladesmiths would recognize because he brought metallurgy to us. And he's since become a friend and actually allowed me to co he's put my name as a co-author in a couple of papers now, which has been really exciting. And that let's not forget John Verhoeven. Yeah, I, I certainly know his name. I've never met him, but uh, I, I, I've been reading his paper since I was in college when he yeah. started in on the, the Woots materials. I have a few of his papers in on that topic in my backpack at the moment. Um, yeah, he's been quite instrumental in, yeah. uh, in so that. Have you, um, have you read Larry Thomas's stuff? He's got a couple of books on metallurgy that I've seen in passing and I bought them. But yeah, I... I I started reading his book on the story of knife steel. Yeah. Um, I intentionally avoided purchasing the first one that he wrote, not because I think there's anything wrong with it, but actually because I suspect it's really, really good. But I'm in the process of trying to write a book of my own for our blacksmithing community, not specifically to the blade makers, but the general blacksmiths. 
and I didn't want to be unduly influenced by someone else's excellent work. Uh, so I've, I've actually avoided that, but I've heard really good things about it. Yeah, you know, Pat, that's very legitimate. I recently was um, sent a, a copy, a digital copy of a book by um, some uh, uh, some good friends that are smiths in Africa on uh, uh, knife making. And um, as I started reading it, I said, I have to stop reading this. I'll get back with you later, but it's going to, I, I, I want to uh, apologize ahead of time. We are so alike in our thoughts on this, that it's going to look like my writings are plagiarizing you. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yeah. So um, I know that, that, uh, that Laren's books are geared more specifically to the knife community than the general blacksmith. Sure. Um, I know that uh, Dr. Verhoeven wrote a book on metallurgy for, for blacksmiths. Um, what I'm trying to do with mine is, is just explain the same concepts, like the concepts are, are have those haven't really changed in the last 70 years or something, but I'm just trying to bring a different approach to their explanations that hopefully will connect with uh, some people would, would find it to be uh, something they can connect with. A lot of, put people in the in the blacksmithing community are at least mildly interested in metallurgy but they are intimidated by the topic yeah. uh, it's very it's, intimidated by the topic it's interesting well, and, and, go, go ahead. ahead oh okay it's interesting you should say that pat because i've seen it i've seen that too over the years um as far as hammer skills and the finishing and the shaping bladesmiths really need to take lessons from blacksmiths but yeah, I, I, bladesmiths, because we deal more with heat treatment of steels than blacksmiths do, latched onto the metallurgy a little more quickly than I've noticed a lot of blacksmiths have. So I think your book is really needed. Yeah, I well, hope so. Um, all yeah. those things I mentioned a few minutes ago about all those historical figures, I would not have known had I not decided to try to take on this endeavor because none of that stuff was taught to me in school. But when I started thinking about how do I share challenging concepts, because some of them are kind of challenging. I mean, for example, if I said to you, I can get one solid to dissolve another solid and you're not already trained as a metallurgist, does that concept even make any sense to you at all? Like, how do you wrap your mind around that? Yeah. I, I, I went to school and I, and the professors said, here's what happens. And they, because they were professors, I just believe what they said. <laughs> right. And and I mean, if they weren't lying to me, but, um, you know, if I'm trying to teach, if I put myself in the position of somebody who doesn't have all of that particular background that I have, and I, yet I want to help, help them understand that concept. How do I do that? Well, somebody had to come up with that concept, you know, cause it didn't always exist, even though the phenomenon always existed, understanding it didn't always exist. So where do we get, that where does that come up and we can find that in those old papers and literature the the original experiments that were done that people began to develop ideas of having something that we now today call a solid solution and ideas of one thing diffusing into another even though they've been doing it for a really long time actually understanding that that was what was happening yeah that's fairly recent yeah. It, it well, it's where, oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, go ahead. Oh, uh, well, um, I, I, I think it's I, I think it's worth bearing in mind when you're reading those old text texts that just because they use the word true state a lot doesn't mean that that stuff wasn't really accurate for the time and spot on. <laughs> oh yeah. yeah. Oh, absolutely. One yeah. of the one of the things that would be interesting to do, and we might need to do a, another couple of these is talk about a lot of the misconceptions that are in the knife making and blacksmithing about heat treatment and composition and all that. I, I know you run into it all the time, Patrick, where people, um, as is often true in artisan work and even in operators in the plant, they know which way to turn the knob. Their explanation of what happens when they turn the knob is not technically correct but it does get them to turn the knob in the right direction. And so you, we trip into those with some regularity. So it'd probably be worthwhile to, to explore some of those things. Declan, 
you've been quiet. You haven't told <laughs> us that you've gone to Harbor Freight and bought that $150 anvil yet and gone online and gotten the $150 propane torch so you can start playing in your garage. What's up with you, Declan? <laughs> Yeah, no, I haven't, I haven't put the, I haven't put the down payment on that yet, but, uh, you know, I have the, I have the, uh, the learned, you know, with my degree and my background, don't have nearly the experience that, uh, Patrick and Kevin do, but I, I think, you know, when you were posing the original question, I was like, well, if I, if I got my equipment, if I got my material how would i go about it and yeah. i would definitely be someone who's getting a thicker piece of material you know knowing that i'd have to learn and you know i definitely wouldn't be trying something like uh like upsetting like ben did there but uh i think there's 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 the challenge of that too right and the 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 interest of it you know i can imagine that is part of the reason why he gravitated towards it. And, uh, but for me, you know, it being a, you know, first kind of blacksmithing project for me, I'd probably be closer to what Pat was describing earlier, where I'm starting with a, a larger block and I'm working that down from there. So. Huh. Oh, yeah, I, I guess I hadn't thought about it, but yeah, if you started with a, a bigger square bar, it'd be a lot easier. You know, one of the first things I I got, I started blacksmithing when Frank Peters got me to go take it from the guy who was a blacksmith at the Manor Colonies, mm -hmm. trying to remember his first name, but he was a great guy. He did a wonderful two-day course. First thing he did was talk about safety around the anvil and around the fire, showed you how to light the fire, gave you a 36 inch or 30 inch piece of half inch steel and said, okay, mark two inches. Now draw it out to seven inches. He'd shown you that you needed to square it up. He'd shown you that you, you needed to make it pointy and use the anvil to do half the work and then round it out. And of course, since none of us had ever done it before, it takes you about 30 minutes to 45 minutes to do it. And you're worn out when you get done and you're ready to sit down and listen to him start teaching you how to do stuff. <laughs> so, and he was really brilliant. So in uh, two days, you made two firearm implements, fire implements, including a weld on one to make the loop. And then you made a cold chisel. And it was really a brilliant course. He he was really good at it. Um, That's a great way to you know the the back and forth of you know the the practice and the theory, and I think that's why you know the the book you were just talking about, Pat. That would why that would be so helpful because you know folks who have the the theory, you know that's could be you know all that knowledge that you have. And they can, you know, apply that to their theory and learn a little, it, it becomes less intimidating, which I think is, you know, what we've been talking about here is, you know, these discussions are so that we can make it less intimidating and more approachable to folks, you know, whether they're just starting out or if they've already got some blacksmithing experience that sounds great 